So as we move up the plant tree of life, we're going to start getting into plants that are going to resemble kind of our stereotypical plants that we think about. But before we really jump into um, especially our vascular plants, we're going to talk about a group of vascular plants today that aren't quite what we think of as normal plants, but they're quite dominant plants and have been important plants for the history of our earth. In fact, a lot of the kind of fun traits that they have show up in our taller plants. Lycophytes, like this club moss here, exhibit very particular growth behavior. In fact, you can actually age these plants by looking at their differences between growing sporangia and the rest of their body. And this is a trait that we see this annual growth that's really common in many trees of temperate climates. And lycophytes are going to start to increasingly display these traits that we see in more kind of uh, highly derived plants. So lycophytes are part of this big group known as kind of the basal vascular plants. They're our first group that's going to have true vascular tissue. So we have the green algaes here, and as we grow up, we get bryophytes, and now we're adding on sporophyte dominant life cycle stages as well as vascular tissue um, here. And we're going to talk about this really big group that's kind of sister to the rest of the plant. These lycophytes include three major uh, families, the lycopodiaceae, the salaginaliaceae, and the isotiaceae. And these groups have a lot of things in common with especially some of our earlier plants that we talked about, like the bryophytes. They reproduce via spores. They're going to have, um, some of them pronounced gametophyte stage, but really here we see a transition into sporophyte stage being dominant. And they're also importantly going to have true vascular tissue, that xylem and phloem that we have talked about last week. And also importantly too, unlike the bryophytes, they're gonna have true root tissues. So not only will these roots anchor them to the ground, but they're also going to use that to bring water into their bodies to move through that vascular tissue, particularly that xylem. And so these can also be seen as a transitionary element getting from bryophytes over into our kind of more dominant vascular plants where these traits are kind of blurring the lines within this group. Globally, the lycophytes make up only about 1,280 species. Um, so really not that diverse when we consider the overall abundance of plants on our life, uh, on, our, on our globe. But globally, they're very distributed. Almost every ecosystem is going to have a lycophyte present in it in some form or another, especially in boreal and arctic areas, as well as down into tropics. We see a lot of them. Um, the lycopodiaceae, the family that makes up the club mosses here, are generally restricted to kind of high latitude and mountainous environments. So these are plants you'll see mainly if you go up north into the boreal forest, or if you're in the tropics, go up a mountain, and you'll generally see these kind of clustered there. The other big group that we see as we kind of move up our phylogenetic tree, the lycophytes, are the salaginellaceae. And these are mostly a really strong tropical order. In fact, probably when it comes to diversity in lycophytes, this family is really where we're going to see a lot of that diversity. And we're still discovering new species within this clade, even today in the tropics. But there's also a lot of temperate species, um, especially the genus Salaginelle, um, which grows pretty commonly in rock outcrops in Canada. And then lastly, and probably one of the more interesting groups we have in the lycophytes are, is the Isotiaceae. And this is a freshwater group that has a lot of important kind of adaptations in it that we don't see until we get almost to the gymnosperms again especially some of their xylem tissue and how that's arranged in them. The lycophytes are uh, united through, again, this alteration, uh, alternation of generation stages. And what they do is, again, they're going to have this gametophyte stage and a sporophyte stage. But here, the sporophyte stage is the primary unit of photosynthesis. And when you look at a plant, you're generally going to be looking at that sporophyte. 
but and the gametophyte stage is still there and unusually in many of these groups that the gametophyte is actually a subterranean living thing so if you're ever looking for gametophytes in these things it's worth getting down on your hands and knees and really searching around in the soil litter to find these gametophytes and a lot of times you can find them also interesting is this group is a true branching group that they are going to have vascular tissue that allows them to put out branches. So unlike the bryophytes, which are not exactly tiny trees, these can be seen as true tiny trees with their little branching that goes on. In more detailed structure though, what, what, these, what this sporophyte life cycle means um, for the lycophytes is that these lycophytes are going to have a structure called a sporangium. They're gonna be kind of singly uh, uh, growing per leaf. And the sporangium is where we're going to see the reproductive tissue develop. We call this a synapomorphy because this trait is what really allows us to, to look at all these different plants and say, yes, they are a single entity that is a product of evolution and they all share a same common ancestor. Moreover, with this, uh, this sporangium, we also see that they have two different types of spores. Um, we call this heterospory. We have a microspore, which has a, a haploid um, born spores in them. And then we also have a megaspore, which again are haploids too. And with this, the consequence of this haploid and, or this megaspore and microspore is that the megaspore tends to develop into um, what we would consider a female. It's not truly um, divided up like that, but it's going to produce eggs and the microspore is typically going to produce spore, sperm on them. So we see that not only are the sporophyte now dominant and we have these kind of very complex structures to store our sexual reproductive structures, but we also starting to see kind of a sexual differentiation starting to develop in, in plant kingdom. But this lycopodes, these kind of traits that they all share and familiar are also um, kind of hiding the diversity that's in this group. Um, when we think about things like angiosperms and gymnosperms, they're very similar organisms more or less. But the lycophytes are pretty diverse um, as far as how closely related they actually are to each other. And because of that, we see some very interesting traits, especially with the, the differences between the salogenolaceae and the isotetiaceae and their sister group, the lycopodiaceae here. All of these have spores that are able to reproduce with. But one of the things that you don't see in the Lycopodiaceae, but you do see in these other two groups, is that you see the development of a structure called the ligule. A ligule is a very specialized piece of leaf tissue that differentiates the leaf from the stem. And so this is the first time we actually see a major plant organ start to split and start to become different things. Um, the ligule is based in this kind of uh, small cluster at the base in the isotiaceae, and in the salogenolaceae, they're going to be parts of the kind of, they're going to actually form true leaf tissues there. Importantly to us in the story of evolution of plants, the isotiaceae, these kind of aquatic plants, have secondary xylem. And the secondary xylem is more or less can be viewed as a pre-adaptation that would be shaped later on in other lineages to allow massive growth because the secondary xylem is essentially allowing the, these plants to deposit um, structural compounds into their xylem tissue that it will allow them to reach massive size. And it's really curious that we find them first in these small aquatic plants. The Lycopodiaceae is known as the club moss, and we probably have around 380 species. But because of modern genetics, we really don't have a good grip on what is a species anymore. Particularly what's been problematic about kind of figuring out what a species is in this group is the ploidy numbers are really out of control. And they seem to vary from just population to populations a lot of times. In fact, we think that a lot of these have had repeated events where those chromosome counts have doubled and tripled uh, repeatedly. Um, in fact, some lycopodes, it's not uncommon to have a situation where you could have a 2N individual having over 275 chromosomes. 
Despite their kind of relevance and dominance, especially in boreal situations, um, the Lycopodiaceae have had a lot of limited human use um, to them. Um, formerly, they were used as lubricants. Um, some of the oils, especially in their spores, um, are, had some, some limited industrial um, connotations. In fact, some of the first widely um, avail commercially available condoms were actually lubricated with these spores. Um, but probably the most important and most widely known um, ethnobotanical use was their use as flash powder. Because like I was saying, we can use these spores as a lubricant, but, the, but this lubricant is also highly flammable. And all it takes is finding all it takes is finding some lycopodes in the forest, going up to them with a lighter, and just putting a little flame on it, and they immediately kind of take off. They're extremely flammable. Why that they develop this kind of oily outer coating that allows them to be so flammable, we don't really know, and there's not any really good explanations for it. But it's likely a trait that's never really been selected on, but that oil and substance that they have likely allows them to, those spores to prevent being rotted. The Salaginellaceae is another kind of really big group in this. Um, we have about 750 species that have all been placed in one genera. So we probably need to do some dividing up of that group. But these are a group of very small terrestrial plants. In fact, a lot of times they're mistaken for bryophytes. But really, in reality, they're not really closely related to bryophytes at all. They're more closely related to things like true ferns than they would be to the bryophytes. The, one of our big taxonomic problems with this group is that they're pretty much a tropical group. Although there are representatives kind of as far north as the Arctic Circle, a lot of them are mainly located in the tropics, and a lot of them grow uh, as epiphytes on trees, which have made them kind of inaccessible to scientists as we've been trying to name them and discover new species. Interestingly about them is that they, a lot of the species have this resurrection habitat to them, habit to them, where if they're dry, they kind of look dead, dried out, and brown but just add a little water to them and they almost immediately expand and really look like a kind of a tropical plant. In fact, a lot of these plants you can find in kind of ornamental situations and in uh, commercial greenhouses being sold as resurrection plants. This is also because of their kind of unusual taxonomic place right in the middle of this big lycopite relative group. They've been used as model organisms to again explore kind of the genetic evolution of plants overall. And one of my favorite groups and the last major groups that are in this kind of huge lycophyte um, grouping are the, is the Isotiaceae. And this is a, a group of primarily one genera, the Isoetes, that are all freshwater species. There's no marine species um, in this group. And most of them live in kind of clear, shallow waters, especially in clear streams, we find them really uh, commonly. In fact, most of the rare and endangered plants we have in the United States, especially in the South East region, are the Isotiaceae because they're really affected by kind of turbidity in water and our channelization of streams and diverting and building of dams has really caused a drastic decline in water quality and in uh, sunlight availability through that water column. Isoetaceae are common aquaria plant. Um, you'll find them pretty easily in any pet store that sells aquaria plant um, because they have very kind of slow growth to them and they're very compact and they kind of look kind of just fun hanging out in those ecosystems. Um, interestingly, too, part of them is that their spores are located in this basal area here. And by peeling back these leaves, they'll reveal those macro megaspores that are common in the Lycopodiaceae. As well as, again, just to reemphasize that secondary xylem. And when we think about um, Isotiaceae now, we think about these kind of small, punky things. But really, they're the direct descendants of a long line of uh, really important plants that were some of the first probably get on land, especially some of the first to evolve woodiness 
because of this secondary xylem tissue that they put down. And this goes back to a very important time of our, in our world, especially for us now. The Carboniferous period is where we first saw these ancient lycophytes really kind of diversify and evolve. In fact, those ancestors of the Isotheaceae made up these huge forests of, of lycophyte trees, as well as some of the members of club mosses and another group called um, the horsetails, which we'll be exploring in a, uh, a couple weeks from now. But these forests really preserved very well, and our, their remnants are scattered throughout Western North America. In fact, National uh, Petrified uh, Forest National Park, um, where I was doing my PhD um, in Arizona, is filled with the kind of the fossils and leftover remains of these giant forests during the Carboniferous period. But probably what we really need to recognize about the Carboniferous period is that this is where most of our fossil fuels come from today, is the remains of these plants. And these plants um, were the first to truly get wood, and once they fell and kind of started to get preserved in these kind of massive uh, ancient swamps, they were able, under pressure, to get turned into um, coal and other petroleum reserves. And these deposits are scattered quite across most of our terrestrial systems, which suggests that these ecosystems really dominated the globe during the Carboniferous period. But the thing that has kind of caught up to you is that we were taking kind of ancient CO2 from the atmosphere that the plants brought in to build themselves up and taking this ancient energy from the sun and trapping it in. And now that we're digging all these up and using them and combusting them, we're releasing these massive amounts of CO2 into our atmosphere that really, frankly, we kind of borrowed it from ancient periods. And because of this, we've been kind of, we've been manipulating the carbon balance throughout our atmosphere, which has led to very serious impacts from global climate change. And interestingly too, one of the reasons why we think that these deposits might have formed in the first place is because being the first woody plants, that this wood was a very new adaptation. And there wasn't a lot of other organisms that were able to respond to it. And nowadays, most of the time when a wood falls on the forest floor, it's going to get colonized by fungi, especially white rot fungi, which is really good at breaking up that cellulose. But it was likely that this, woody, this white rot fungus hadn't came about yet in the Carboniferous forest, allowing us to kind of store and capture this energy, maybe for better or maybe for worse for our ecosystems today. So a quick recap is lycophytes are a relatively species poor group. There's not too many of them, but they are spread throughout the globe and some of the areas they can really dominate some of their ecosystems in a lot of ways. But importantly for us, they really represent kind of a transition from bryophytes into true modern vascular plants that we see a lot. And the lycophytes are going to be this big group that includes these other three groups, the club mosses, the Salaginellaceae, and Isoedes. And these, are, these groups are pretty primarily responsible for the fossil fuels and the carbon storages we have today that we use uh, probably too much in our energy consumption. <laughs>